All right. Hope that you'll take a Bible and turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And we will be looking at verses 12 to 14. You can find that on Pew Bible page 862. 862. 1 John 2, verses 12 to 14. And before we read it, I need to offer a few words of introduction to set the context. The Apostle John has been laying out exhortations and commands for these Christians. He's been saying, for example, in verse 3, we know that we have come to know him, that is Jesus, the righteous one, if we keep his commands. Our obedience to God's commands is an evidence that we have come to know him. He's also said that the command is to love our brothers and sisters in God's family. We cannot say we love God if we do not love God's family. And before going on to continue with the exhortations and continuing with the instruction, and he's going to do that in verse 15, and he'd say, do not love the world or anything in the world. Before he does that, he gives, in effect, a parenthesis. A parenthesis, sometimes called a, a digression here. And many have struggled to make sense of what is this doing here? Why, in the midst of these instructions, does he start talking about dear children, fathers, young men? What's going on here? And, and commentators have wrestled with making sense of, of these verses because they're highly stylistic and repetitive and all kinds of unanswered questions remain. But here's what seems to be going on. Someone may think at this point, okay, you've been giving these instructions. You're telling me to obey God's commands, to love God's family. You're setting the bar pretty high, John. Maybe too high. This may be too hard for us. How can we do this? How can anyone fulfill these commands? And so at this point, John provides this parenthesis to say, it's not too hard. Holy living is not too hard. If we try to do it by ourselves, by our own strength, by our own efforts, well, then it's impossible. It is impossible, but holy living isn't too hard or impossible for those whose lives have been filled and transformed by the Holy Spirit. Holy living is not too hard or impossible for those whose lives have been filled and transformed by the Holy Spirit, by the intervention of God's grace and God's power. In other, in other words, you can do this. By God's grace, by his power, you can do this. So he reminds them of who they are, what God has done for them, before he goes on to continue with the instruction. So let's see what he says to them here at verse 12. I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Some have seen here in, in the delineation of children, fathers, young men, three different stages of Christian maturity, 
Some have said no. Uh, he can describe the whole audience as dear children as he does at chapter 2, verse 1. He says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. And so some have seen three different groups. Some have seen one group. It's just all Christians to whom he's writing. Some have seen two groups. Some have said, well, the, there's dear children, and then there are older and younger Christians. And we could go around and around, and I don't think it's a very profitable discussion. I don't think we can be uh, firm in any of those conclusions. I do think what he's saying applies to all Christians, and we can all learn from this and learn from what he says. At the same time, we're going to come around to how there is some, some distinction made between children in the faith and older people in the faith. And there are some markers of Christian maturity and what we should look for in Christian maturity. But we'll start with what applies to all Christians, what has been given, what has been done for all Christians. And this is so important, it's, it's foundational. We can't build on the instruction here in 1 John. We can't proceed to try to obey the moral commands without this foundation. Without this foundation. In the same way, we cannot expect the world to follow and obey Christian ethics because they don't have the Holy Spirit. To tell them, do not love the world or anything in the world, for example, makes absolutely no sense to them because they don't have the power of the Holy Spirit working in them. We cannot expect them to do that. We cannot simply expect the world to follow the Sermon on the Mount. It's impossible. Holy living is only possible for those who have been filled and transformed by the Holy Spirit. But we do need to make a distinction when we're talking about holy living and righteousness and obedience. Jesus makes a distinction here between outward righteousness and inward righteousness. So for example, you don't need the Holy Spirit to follow and obey thou shalt not kill. Right? But Jesus says, just saying, well, I've never killed anyone shouldn't lead anyone to become self-satisfied. Have you ever been angry at your brother? Hmm. Have you ever called your brother a fool? Hmm. God sees the heart. God cares about inward righteousness, inward purity, purity of the heart. And for that to happen, we need the inward transforming work of the Holy Spirit to intervene in our lives. In the same way, you don't need the Holy Spirit to be faithful to your spouse. There are plenty of secular, non-Christian people who are faithful to their spouses. But to be faithful to your spouse in your heart, to be vigilant against lust creeping in, to be mindful of what your eyes are seeing, this is where the Holy Spirit is necessary, to purify our hearts. I think that this is very important. We do preach morality. Morality matters. Holiness matters. God's law is God's law, and it is good for Christian and non-Christian alike. The Ten Commandments are good for everyone, but we can't simply expect the world to obey God's commands. They aren't capable of having inward righteousness. But for those who have been given the Holy Spirit, for those whose sins have been forgiven, for those who know him who was from the beginning, those who know that they have overcome the evil one, this is the foundation. And before we go on to apply the instructions to try to obey God's commands, this foundation must be in place. We must be standing in the position of a Christian. We must be born again by the Holy Spirit, or we cannot go on. We can't build if we don't have a foundation. 
But this also matters because sometimes Christians think, well, I don't want to presume on God's forgiveness here. I, I think it's presumptuous for me to, to claim that my sins have been forgiven. I, 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 it's, and, and we fall into this trap of a false humility. And John is going to obliterate all that to show, no, if, if you think that holy living, if you think that this is too hard, well, then you haven't been born again. You don't realize what God has done for you and the power of the person who is working within you. It's really a lack of faith. But because Christians typically fall into the trap of having low standards, we think, well, we're all sinners, right? And, and I can't hold my brother or sister accountable to this standard. We can't, we can't be too uh, strict about holy standards in the, in the church. And I don't want to get up in your business, and I don't want you getting up in my business. And so it's okay for people who are cohabiting, for example, to be members of the church. It's okay for people who are falling short of God's standards of holiness to be members of the church. It's okay because we're all sinners. It's, we don't want to set the bar too high, right? No, no, it is not too hard. If your sins have been forgiven, if you have been born again by the power of the Holy Spirit, then it is not too hard, and it is not unreasonable to demand holiness. Will we all fall short? Absolutely. Do we all need to repent and ask for God's forgiveness? Absolutely. Do we all need to be compassionate and merciful toward our brothers and sisters? Absolutely. But that doesn't change the standard. That doesn't change the standard. It is not too hard. And it's not too hard because of three things in particular that John lays out here. The first in verse 12 is, I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Forgiveness of sins. This is the starting point. Forgiveness of sins. God's commands are not too hard because our sins have been forgiven. And the verb tense that he uses here, have been forgiven. When you see have been or has been written, for example, in the scriptures, usually what you're seeing there is the Greek perfect tense being translated. And the perfect tense communicates something that has happened in the past, but that has ongoing significance. It has been written, it was written in the past, and it's still written now. It still has ongoing significance. So also here, your sins have been forgiven, and they are still forgiven because of his name. Not because of anything you have done, not because of anything I have done, but on account of his name. When John says name, this communicates both the person and the work of Christ. And for this, we go back to the first two verses of chapter 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, his person. This is who he is. He is righteousness. He lived a perfect, righteous, holy life, tempted in every way as we are. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. The atoning sacrifice. He is our righteousness. He lived the life we have not lived, and he died the death that we deserve so that in him we can become the righteousness of God, making atonement for our sins, paying the price, paying the debt that we owe to a holy God, a God who is light and in whom there is no darkness at all. He is our advocate with the Father. 
We have forgiveness on account of his name, his person, his righteous character, and his work, his work, his death, his resurrection on our behalf. So this means a Christian, a born-again, blood-bought believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is not someone who hopes for forgiveness, who merely prays for forgiveness. They know they have been forgiven. And there's no uncertainty in this. And it's not because of any presumption on their part that somehow they deserve to be forgiven. It is because of the shed blood of Jesus on their behalf, in their place. And if you are a Christian, if you have been born again by the power of the Holy Spirit, you know that you have been forgiven. You know that your sins have been atoned for on the cross. And there is nothing that you have done or nothing that you will do that can change what Jesus has done for you. It's not a hope that's based on some kind of loose sense of God's love. God's just too loving to to punish my sin. I can trust God to just be benevolent and kind and, and merciful. No, it's based on what Jesus has done, on the fact that Jesus went to the cross on your behalf. You can stake your life Stake your future on what he has done, on this fact. Trust in Jesus. Trust in his blood. When you know this forgiveness, you know that his commands are not too hard based on what his shed blood has done for you. Do you know that your sins have been forgiven? Or is there still a lingering doubt? Maybe it's not sufficient. Maybe, maybe his death in my place isn't enough. I pray that you would have no uncertainty in your mind, that you would know without any shadow of a doubt that your sins have been paid for in full, in full. And then in verse 13 we see, the knowledge of him who is from the beginning. And we're going to see in verse 14, the knowledge of the Father, God the Father. So knowledge of God the Father and knowledge of God the Son is essential to Christian identity, Christian character, and to being a Christian. And we've seen this in chapter 1, verse 3. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So God sent his Son not only to pay the debt of his people, but also to make it possible for us to know him, to be in fellowship with him, to be in communion with him, to walk with him, to be able to talk to him, to enjoy a personal, intimate relationship with him. And he is the one who is from the beginning. And you see this in, in 1 John 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. Jesus is the word of life. He is the one that the Apostle John is bearing witness to having seen and heard and touched. So do you know God in this concrete real and personal way? Or is God merely an idea, an abstraction, a force, a power? Or is he a person you talk to regularly and consistently from your heart? Well, if you know him in this way, if you know him who is from the beginning, if you know God as Father, then you know that God is your creator. You know that you have life because he gave you life 
You know that he sustains all life. You know that in him we live and move and have our being. You know that it is because of his sheer patience and mercy that the sinful world continues as it does. And you know him as your savior. You know what he has done for you. And you know that you would be just as lost as the world were it not for his sovereign intervention in your life. You know that you deserve his eternal punishment. You know that you deserve nothing less than hell. And yet he intervened. Not because of anything in you, not because of any merit on your part, but because of his sheer mercy in Christ. And you will never get over that. Do you know God in that way? Do you know him in that way? If you do, then you know the Holy Spirit who works in you, who applies the work of Christ, who enables you to cry out, Abba, Father. Not just God in the abstract, but Abba, Father, knowing him personally. And so his commands are not too hard. They're not burdensome. You know that his commands are good. They're all good, and they're all for his glory. And you want to obey your father because of what he has done for you. And then the second half of verse 13, we see, I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. And in each of these cases, we have the Greek perfect tense. Uh, Because you have come to know him who is from the beginning, because you have overcome the evil one. You see it again in the second half of verse 14. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. You have. We may struggle with this because we think, well, I don't really feel like I've overcome the evil one. He tempts me every single day. And I fall prey to his temptation every single day. And I have to ask for God's mercy and confess my sins every single day. So what does John mean? He means that because of what Jesus has done for you, by his triumphant resurrection, he has sent the enemy in retreat. And because of what Jesus has done for you and in your place, the enemy has been overcome. And while, yes, sin continues to to be operative in your life, it is no longer the dominating force in your life. It's no longer the prevailing power in your life. And God is bringing about this sanctifying work in your life to cleanse you and purify you from your sins. From the moment you've been born again, you have overcome the evil one. The victory is not complete, it is not total, but it is certain. It is certain. Satan cannot hold anything against you if you have been born again by the Spirit, if you have been purchased by the blood of Jesus. Whatever Satan says, yeah, well, do you know what Dane did then? You know what Dane was thinking? I I know, I know. And I can't say anything on my own behalf, but I can plead the blood of Jesus. And I can believe from my heart that his blood is sufficient to cover my sins and to cover your sins. And it is efficient by faith to cover my sins. And so, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. No condemnation. Satan can try as he might, but he will not triumph in the end. But notice this this overcoming is grounded in a power outside of ourselves. Young men, you are strong, but it's not your youthfulness that makes you strong. It's because... The word of God lives in you. 
The word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Think of those words from Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young person, literally a young man, stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. How do you stay pure? Walk in a way of purity? By living, by walking according to your word. And what is it about the word of God that gives us this power? Because of the word of God, we can see just how heinous and ugly sin is. Using merely human reasoning, we tend to rationalize. Well, it's not that bad. I mean, I'm not as bad as her. I'm not as bad as him. Sure, I sin. Nobody's perfect. But I, I, I'm nowhere close to that person. So, you know, God probably grades on the scale. And probably someone like Hitler deserves hell, but I don't. And most people are basically good. So we're, I'm probably fine. No, the Word of God says we have all fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. Everyone is a liar. God alone is true. And so the Word of God shows us sin is not just an oops. I'll try again, do better next time. Sin is is a transgression against a holy and eternal God who is well within his rights to snuff us out as he pleases. And it is only because of his patience and mercy that sinners are still living and breathing. The Word of God shows us that. The Word of God also shows us the remedy, shows us what God has done to redeem us from the ugliness of sin, to redeem us from our desperate, helpless position. Therefore, the word of God dwelling in us gives us power, the same power that Jesus used when he was battling against the evil one. Satan is quoting scripture. You realize that? Satan knows scripture. Knows scripture better than we do. And what does Jesus use to combat that? Scripture. It stands written. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And if Jesus needed to rely on it is written, on the word of God written, how much more do we? In our struggle against the evil one, we need this power from outside of ourselves to save us. So if you have knowledge of the forgiveness of your sins, and it's knowledge, certain knowledge, not hypothetical, not wishful thinking, but certain knowledge that Jesus' blood has paid for your sins. If you have personal, intimate knowledge of God the Father and God the Son through the work of the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit in your heart and in your life. If you have overcome the evil one, you know the triumphant power of God's grace, well then these commands are not impossible. They are not too hard. God can help you. His power is sufficient. The one living in you is greater than the one who is in the world. That applies to all Christians. Well, let's just note a few distinctions between dear children, fathers, and young men. Notice what he says to the dear children in verse 12. Because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. And then in verse 14, I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. In the beginning stages of the Christian life, the most elementary stages this is what we should know, that our sins have been forgiven and we know God as Father. We know God as Father. We see everything we have as a gift from God. We see his grace given to us. We see the gift of Jesus' work on the cross given to us. And like a child, we are completely dependent upon our Heavenly Father. 
And while that dependence continues, we can sometimes think that's all there is to it. But as we grow in the faith, as we mature in the faith, we start to realize it's also a fight. (laughs) It's also a fight. And while we can always rest on what Jesus has done for us, and we rest in our knowledge of God as our Heavenly Father, as our Abba Father, it's important that he writes to the young men about overcoming the evil one. You're strong. The Word of God lives in you. Buck up. To use a biblical expression, gird your loins. Get ready. This is not easy. This is not easy. You have an enemy, a roaring lion, who prowls around looking for someone to devour. You've got to be vigilant. And anyone who's lived the Christian life knows this reality. Knows that sanctification, while we rely on the power of the Holy Spirit, does require effort. It requires everything we have. Everything we have. Discipleship is costly. Costly. And just to illustrate it from my own life, you may think that preaching gets easier the older you get, the more sermons you preach. It's actually the opposite, I've found. It actually gets harder because your standards are higher and your expectations of, of what you think should happen in, in preaching, in a sermon, are more complicated and it gets harder. And the more you live the Christian life, the more you, you see the intricacies and the complications of living the Christian life, and the more you come to see the depth of God's Word, it doesn't get easier. It doesn't get easier. But for the fathers, for the older ones, he repeats, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you fathers, again in verse 14, because you know him who is from the beginning. The goal of the Christian life Spiritual maturity looks like knowing the giver himself, enjoying the fullness of communion with the giver himself. Face to face is what you long for, to know God, to see Christ face to face. To be able to say with the Apostle Paul, to live is Christ. If, if God gives me life here, it's Christ. I will make the most of it. I will serve him faithfully with everything I have. But to die is gain. To die is gain. Because to die is to be with him in person. To see him face to face. To enjoy the glory of his presence. That's Christian maturity. That's what we should long for. And we should pray for that kind of maturing work to take place in us through the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not too hard. If you have these gifts, if the Holy Spirit has transformed and filled your life, then holy living is possible. If you question that, that's a lack of faith. It's doubting God. God says you can. By his grace, by his power, you can. Let's strive to live holy lives marked by faithfulness. Amen. As he empowers us.